Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are in this and the part of the world that you're joining us from. My name is Anthony Chow. I'm the director of San Jose State University School of Information. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our celebration and recognition of Asian American Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander History Month. This uh, longer title helps establish uh, some of the immense diversity uh, in our community. Chat is on. So please take a moment to share and chat where you're joining us from. It's always great to see uh, that diversity. It gives me and the iSchool great pleasure to support equity, diversity, and inclusion in all of its beauty and power. And I want to thank our outstanding speaker and speakers and panelists for taking the time to join us today. The theme of today's symposium is self-care, challenge, and solidarity. And this is a part of our EDI Symposium series sponsored by the iSchool. All of our EDI Symposium recordings and transcripts and resources are available in our EDI i library. And please subscribe to our brand new EDI YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, uh, Alfredo, if you wouldn't mind, just drop that in the in the chat. Uh, you'll that way you can be notified uh, uh, on each of the new EDI Symposium recordings and transcripts that we post each month. For today's session, if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature and someone from our distinguished panel will answer it. Also periodically we'll make chat available as we have now and also at the end of the session for additional questions and comments. Today's symposium is of course very personal for me. In college at San Francisco State, I was very active in the community and ultimately became president of the San Francisco Chinese American Democratic Club and ran for school board in 1994 as the Asian candidate for our school board in San Francisco. After that unsuccessful bid, my wife and I returned home to Florida to start a family, and I lost touch with advocating for Asian American issues in many ways. And part of me hoped that being in a biracial relationship with mixed race children would somehow leave the color of my skin behind me. Alas, this certainly didn't happen, especially being in an environment where there were very few that looked like me. The stares, the racial slurs coming from crowds of people, from cars, and of course, the various acts of racial discrimination against my children were constant. Worst of all, it all happened in silence and misalignment between the normalized racism towards me and my family and the norms of society much of this discrimination and racism occurred in public spaces. At a meeting that ultimately determined that we were going to homeschool our children, I had a principal tell me she did not understand why I was upset that my daughter was bullied and faced with discrimination from her classmates because she was one of the top students in the class. Two years ago, as the pandemic began, our house in North Carolina became a focal point for five instances of teenagers ringing our doorbell at all hours of the day and leaving nasty notes, trash, rotten eggs on our doorstep. Today, despite the constant reminders by some of our community and the mass media that people that look like me and my children is in some ways not normal. We still have the power to move forward. We are still resolute and in many, in so many ways, happy, joyful, law-abiding and extremely productive members of society. We do, however, live our lives knowing that something is likely going to happen to one of us out of the blue, and that is just part of the burden of being AANHPI. We can and must, and I'm confident that we will do better for us today and especially our children and our grandchildren and the children after that. I also want to be clear that success, whether it be financial, academic, et cetera, does not completely protect any person of color. A quote from my former chancellor, who I had the privilege to work with very closely at UNC Greensboro, such an impressive person that is black and the most powerful person at that university, he told me one day, Anthony, I'm still a black man once I walk off this campus. Today marks another opportunity to discuss the very real situation being faced by the AANHPI community 
which is very, very diverse. It's an opportunity to celebrate all of the contributions, but also in some way share the silent suffering faced by many in our community. I'm so honored and impressed by all of the outstanding speakers that have taken the time to join us today. We'll begin with a keynote address and discussion with Andy Bo, the 22, 2023 president of Apollo, uh, uh, of the Asian, which is the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association, and Alana Iko Moore, who is the Apollo executive director. And we'll follow that with an outstanding panel discussion about priorities facing the NHPI community and how libraries can best support our community. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Annie and Alana, our fearless leaders of Apollo. Ladies, the Zoom floor is yours. All right, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Anthony. And I know both Annie and myself um, send big hugs for everything you and your family have had to endure. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hand it over to Annie. All right. Great. Welcome, everyone, to our keynote talk, which is titled Self Care Challenges Solidarity Asian American Women Leaders. Um, the format of this keynote is a conversation between Alana and myself. Um, we're really excited for this opportunity to speak with you all today, and I want to just take a moment to thank Dr. Anthony Chow for sharing his um, personal journey, his vulnerability with us, and also for this opportunity um, to speak. And also a big thank you to the San Jose State High School. And also wishing everybody a happy Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So with that, we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so it is finally Friday. Um, I know so many of us have been getting through the week, getting through the month. A lot of times um, during May, we have more um, expectations placed upon us or our communities. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here with um, all of you today. And if you want to take a minute and just pop into the Slido, um, how you're doing today, um, would love to um, love to see slash hear it. Um, it should populate. Um, if it doesn't populate, I do apologize. It should be working. So it's just in one word, how are you feeling today? Um, I feel excited. Um, and I'm also feeling um, a little bit fatigued. I guess that's two words. Um, how are you doing today, Annie? I'm feeling pretty fired up and also a little bit feeling tired as well. But I think we have a good session up ahead today. Yeah, I think so many of us um, do feel that that exhaustion, that fatigue, that tiredness. Um, also mixed with optimism, right? We definitely need to make the space for, for rest and rejuvenation. Um, so thank you so much for um, dropping in how, you, how you're how you feeling today. And I feel like this is a good way for all of us to know that, you know, we're not, we're not alone in feeling a lot of these things. And we are, again, so grateful to be here today with all of you. So we'd like to start today with the land acknowledgement and recognizing that um, the indigenous people who are the original inhabitants of the land that all of us are on were dispossessed of their land through violence, through murder, through deceptive processes and colonialism. And since, um, you know, since these things are often, um, land acknowledgements are often done without action, Annie and I have made a donation today to the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center in support of the land that we are on. And I am situated on Hui Chen, the unceded Lushan Ohlone territory, now known as the East Bay in the San Francisco, California area. And I am situated on the ancestral and unceded land of the Kumeyaay people, the traditional caretakers of the land and surrounding ecoscape, past, present, and future. And we've also shared some um, resources in the chat for folks to learn more about whose land you are on. 
All right, so the next section is just more about introductions about who we are <laughs> as the speakers of this. Um, just a couple of notes for today. Uh, we will be using the terms Asian American and AAPI interchangeably throughout this talk, but we are using these terms with intention. So Alana and I both identify as Asian American. And so when we are referring to ourselves, we will be using the phrase um, Asian American, but when we are talking about the work of APALA, APALA being the Asian Pacific American Librarian Association, uh, we will also be using AAPI. And the reason why we want to be intentional about our language is that sometimes people do use AAPI when they actually mean Asian American. Um, and that can inadvertently erase the experiences and expertise of Pacific Islanders and not necessarily um, engaging them. And so, you know, with that in mind, saying AAPI can also be a way of building solidarity between our two, uh, well, not our two, between our communities and also acknowledging that these communities, our communities are very, very diverse. And we will definitely talk more about that in a little bit. So again, my name is Andy Fo, she, her. I am the uh, current Apollo president, and I'm also the head of instruction and outreach at the University of San Francisco. Um, I've been a librarian now for about 10 years, which is pretty wild for me to reflect back on. I don't know how time passes by so quickly. Um, and I've also served on the Apollo executive board in a variety of roles before trying on the president hat. Oh, Alana, I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Alana Ikemore, and I'm the current Asian Pacific American Librarians Association Executive Director. And like Annie, um, I've also been involved with Apala for many years as a past president, member at large, and on various committees. Um, I am also gobsmacked that I've been a librarian um, for 15 years, and I currently do work at the University of California, San Diego, as the head of community engagement and inclusion and the ethnic studies um, librarian. And in this role, I work to create um, belonging for our diverse populations and work on projects to make our library more inclusive to BIPOC, queer, and other students. Um, and librarianship is actually my second career. My first career was in nonprofit uh, social justice organizations. Um, so a little introduction to Apala, since we're doing introductions. Um, the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association was founded in 1980, and it is dedicated to really creating opportunities within our myriad of communities, right? We are not a monolith, um, to really create dialogue between Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander library workers and those who serve those communities, um, creating opportunities to do programming, um, have difficult conversations, exchange ideas, advocate, network, and build our leadership. And we currently have just under 700 members, and we've recently also started um, having local chapters as well. All right, so the next section is just a little bit more about our journeys as leaders. So yeah, Alana, um, how has your background informed your approach to leadership? Um, thank you so much for that question, Annie. So a little bit about my background. So I grew up in Hawaii as a fourth generation mixed race uh, Japanese American. I was a settler and guest on illegally colonized land. And um, that is something that I think a lot of folks who live in Hawaii um, choose not to acknowledge or recognize. And the myriad of folks who go visit or um, engage in tourism um, do not recognize that as well. Um, super important to um, support and give back to the native and indigenous people there. Um, I left um, the islands and went to college um, in the continental United States on a scholarship. And while in college came out as um, bisexual, but I now identify as queer. I am also neurodivergent. I have invisible disabilities um, that impact me kind of on a daily basis. And, you know, I also have quite a bit of privilege. Um, I have the privilege of being light-skinned. I have the privilege of being cisgender. 
I have the privilege of currently being able-bodied and middle-class, and I have the privilege of, um, despite having huge student loans, I do have the privilege of having gone to college. Um, among all of those identities, um, my most important identities are those of a queer parent and as that of a partner to my wonderful trans spouse. And um, this is a photo of us from earlier this month um, on our first trip to Disneyland, which we gave to the kids as a thank you for being so diligent about masking um, throughout the whole of the pandemic and long after many of their classmates had um, long forgone the face covering. Um, and I do show this picture as well to raise visibility and to show that um, there are um, queer, queer Asian parents, there are queer Asian families, and that we we do exist um, and we do procreate and have children and we are really happy. So this is my definitely my most important um, identity. Um, reflecting on my background and how that informs my leadership. So the picture here is of two lemons. The one on the left is what we imagine to be like the lemon you buy in the grocery store or that your neighbor who's the awesome gardener um, gives you, right? It's perfectly round. It's a beautiful yellow, deep yellow color. The skin is smooth. And the lemon on the right is the one that um, grows on the tree in my yard. And in a lot of ways, I feel like this is really on brand because um, you know, this lemon is like got a really thick skin that it's kind of lumpy. The color's like kind of more like a whitish yellow. And um, to some folks, it may feel like this lemon doesn't belong, right? It's not a lemon. But I have to say, like, you know, as someone holding intersectional identities, I've often struggled with feeling like I was not enough, right? Not enough, um, don't belong, don't fit in. And over time, um, growing into myself, this transformed into a passion to really fight for other people who feel like they didn't belong. And that's how I got involved in um, social justice work in my first career, which I've carried that through librarianship, right? And so like looking at these lemons, there's not just one way to be a lemon, you know? There's not just one way to be a leader. There's not just a certain type of person that gets to be a leader, someone from a specific race or specific gender that gets to be a leader. Even if we don't look or act like what people think a leader is, um, you know, as part of the AAPI community, we do belong and we have so much to contribute to the profession. Um, leadership to me is about community. Um, I was raised to care about the community. Um, I was raised with, um, although I am mixed race, raised with a lot of, um, in, a, in a large Japanese family with a lot of traditional Asian values. I was raised to care about the community and the family and to really notice and call attention to other people's success and they in turn would lift you up. And this is in some ways kind of a polar opposite to kind of a white Western style that's very individualistic and competitive. Um, so I openly reject that. Um, I try to create space for lots of voices, um, genuine dialogue, attention to multiple identities, acknowledgement of power and privilege, and really engaging in self-reflection and social activism um, is a huge part of how I identify as a leader. So I'm what about you? Are there any cultural values that inform your leadership? Yeah, definitely. Um, so just a little bit more about my background. I am a Vietnamese American, cisgendered, able-bodied woman, a child of refugees, uh, and a settler and guest on this land. Um, a lot of my early life I also didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. Um, I grew up in Orlando, Florida as a young child, um, which is a diverse city, but at the time I was one of very few Asian kids at my school and was constantly reminded by everyone that I was not from here. Uh, when I was 10, my family moved to Northern California, Sonoma County specifically, where again, I was one of very few Asian kids at my school. Uh, and where I grew up there was even less diverse than Florida. So I really spent a lot of time at the library, um, spent a lot of time reading about other people's stories, um, world, just learning about other people's worlds. And like that kind of helped build out my understanding of like empathy and also imagination. So yeah, growing up, the public library was a safe space for me and my uh, siblings. My mom being an immigrant, 
She loves a good deal. So when she found out that the library was this place where you could go and get free books, free movies, free babysitting, she would just leave me and my siblings there for hours while she went to the store or whatever, um, which I'm pretty sure most library workers do not appreciate. Um, and my mom was actually really strict and overprotective. And so I think this is also a testament to how she saw the library as this like place where she could kind of leave us there. Um, but yeah, I mean, spending a lot of time there, this is also where I found a lot of help for my homework assignments. Again, my parents, English is not their first language. And so with my schoolwork and things like that, this was a, this particular um, library, this, the picture that I'm showing here is actually a picture of the library branch where I would go to when I was a young kid. It actually doesn't exist anymore because they've remodeled, but um, yeah, it was, through my time here and also in high school, I volunteered at the same library, which in turn for my free labor, my library fines and my family's library fines were forgiven. So that was like really made my mom happy. Um, but yeah, it was like through this work here that I learned the value of a library to a community and how powerful it is to connect people to information. And it's, as well as the importance of like a warm space um, where kids can just read and learn and like read to earn free pizzas, for example. But yeah, these are the kinds of things that inspired me to be a librarian. So other cultural values that inform my work. So being raised in a Vietnamese household, I very much learned early on that family, community, and mutual aid are really, really important. So again, my parents are refugees. They came here with nothing in their pocket. And so this mentality that if somebody has enough money to eat, then you make sure that the resources that you have that you feed everybody else, you help everybody else around you um, that you can help. And so I think those were definitely values that were instilled in me as um, a young person. Um, this picture here is a picture of my parents preparing a Vietnamese style hot pot. Um, as many of you are probably know, it's a communal meal and um, the Vietnamese style, we like to roll it up into spring rolls too. And I think this kind of says a lot about um, the culture where I was raised. So, you know, this idea that everybody pitches in because you got to do the work so that you can eat. <laughs> and also, um, no matter where you are, whether you're at home or if you're away from home, that you also have to keep the community in mind. And so um, I think the way that I was raised doesn't always serve me well in more westernized environments where individualism is rewarded. And I think that is a tension that I have to balance as a leader. Um, other frameworks that in form how I approach leadership. I very much pull from feminism and feminist values, which emphasizes the collective, empathy, emotional intelligence, and also trusting intuition, as well as the uh, ideas that you lift as you climb. I don't believe that leadership is about being the loudest person in the room. I don't think that leadership means that you have to do everything. It's also about using your positional authority to give space and agency to other people to shine and also be leaders in their own right which is a great transition into our next section. What have we learned? <laughs> so. All right. So um, if you wanna continue this, I'm curious, like on your leadership journey, are there things you've learned um, serving in Apollo in various leadership roles? Yeah. Oh, wait, you wanna go first, sorry. <laughs> Here, you go first and then I'll go after. Okay, no problem. Um, so I've had times in my workplace where um, I didn't have opportunities to grow or I kind of hit hit a wall trying to move up or you know hit that bamboo ceiling. Um, and so what really saved me were places like Apollo, places that actually saw all of my potential, all of the things that I could um, contribute and really believed in me. And, um, you know, Apollo, immediately was like, yeah, why don't you join a committee and, you know, make sure you can chair it. And, you know, we, maybe I had never chaired a committee before, but Apollo was like, you can totally do it. No big deal. And so I think it's like through those, those experiences and that belief, um, I was able to build my leadership skills around facilitation, project management, program planning. And I was allowed to do all this while being my whole self, which I think a lot of us who work in primarily white institutions, which librarianship is, um, it can be dangerous to come to work with your full authentic self. Um, and so being in that space, I think, um, has been really amazing and um, really, really healing. I've built strong relationships and I've also learned so much about um, 
all of the different groups, the hundreds of different cultures and groups that are living under this umbrella of, um, of AAPI. Um, and, you know, during these challenging times that Anthony, you know, um, referred to these times with like an increase in anti-Asian hate crime, being in this community of folks where you don't have to explain why what happened was awful um, is, it's a gift and it's a boon. And um, to be able to grieve together, to be able to um, hold quiet space together, um, I think is, has been an incredible thing about serving um, in Apollo and being able to make those spaces for other people. Because as we know, um, within AAPI communities, there's not enough attention to mental health. We don't talk about it enough within our communities. There's a lot of stigma for taking life-saving medications or for going to therapy. Um, and a lot of times when we do make those steps to try and get uh, support or help, um, a lot of places aren't set up with materials in other languages or with um, providers that that um, are able to understand our culture and really um, provide that kind of support. So I feel like I've learned um, so much from Apala around advocacy and solidarity. What about you? Yeah, I think I would second a lot of what you said. I think Apala for me has been what I consider you know, my first like professional home, I think it's a space where in other workspaces um, where I feel like there are silences around the issues that face like Asian Americans. I think that within Apollo, I don't think I have to do that same level of explanation. Um, but I think in my term as the Apollo president, I have definitely learned some really big lessons. So first lesson is no more social events or anything at tiki bars. Um, you know, as Alana mentioned earlier, Apollo has really grown in numbers and we really need to be more intentional about how we engage with all of the uh, members within Apollo, um, especially with our Pacific Islander colleagues. And I don't have to be a member of, you know, a different like ethnic group or I don't have to be Pacific Islander to be able to listen and learn and be intentional to make sure that Apollo is serving um, everyone and uh, not necessarily like just regarding people. So I think that's also something that, you know, I have learned and really thought a lot about. And I think that this is really a challenge in AAPI spaces. You know, Apollo is kind of a catch-all space for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, which again is a really large diverse group with very different, sometimes competing interests very different backgrounds. And, you know, when you're the president, it's a, it's a, technically a three-year term, but like your year as president goes by really, really fast. And I have learned that it's really important to center um, my values and the work that I do, because sometimes a lot of things do come up that you don't anticipate. And it's, remember, it's a good reminder to kind of come back to like what grounds you and what moves your work forward as you work through some of the challenges that come up. And then the final lesson learned here is that, again, this is a 100% volunteer run organization and we just are not gonna be perfect. The group project can work down, like break down. This is a huge group project, right? So sometimes somebody misses a detail that actually is quite significant. Uh, maybe someone doesn't feel comfortable in speaking up and then things just like move along until it's too late and somebody has been harmed by one of our actions um, or inaction. And I think it's really important to learn from our mistakes and also recognize, again, this with a volunteer organization, sometimes people are really maxed out on their capacity. Um, and also that burnout is very real, as we saw in the uh, poll earlier, a lot of people are feeling really tired right now. And so I think kind of balancing, letting people have the space to take care of themselves so that they're not burning out um, and also trying to balance the work that we think is really, really important. 100%, I really agree. Okay. All right, so the next part is um, more about barriers and challenges. So um, this is another opportunity for us to hear from you. Um, 
What do you think are some of the challenges faced by women identified leaders who fall under the Asian American Pacific Islander um, umbrella? Um, we have some ideas, but we also would um, know a lot of you have been marinating on this as well. Um, what do you think are some of the challenges? We mentioned earlier um, the bamboo ceiling, which um, I neglected to actually define for folks who may not be familiar with that term, but um, the bamboo ceiling would be an example of a challenge. Um, it's a term that was defined by um, Jane Hune, and it really refers to a combination of individual, cultural, and organizational factors that impede um, that impede career progress to kind of those higher levels, right? And it's subjective factors like um, this person lacks leadership potential. They have awful communication skills. There are things that can't actually be um, quantifiable, right? Um, so we have stereotypes about our upbringing, stereotypes of what we can and cannot do, um, gross middle-aged white men hitting on us, disgusting tropes of dragon lady, kind of against that subservient geisha. Yeah, imposter syndrome is such a big one for so many of us. Being raised to be quiet and defer to others. You know, the stereotype that we're passive, we're doormats, we're supposed to manage everything, but yet not actually lead. Um, not being taken seriously. It can be difficult to know um, when you have a valuable contribution or if you're misreading the situation. The expectation to do so much emotional labor, right? The sexualization, that's coming up a lot, right? Being not Asian enough if you can't speak your cultural language. Pressures to answer questions about your culture. That's the worst. Um, or being asked to use your language in a professional setting when that's not what you were actually hired for. You know, the lack of room for professional growth and upward mobility is something that um, comes up a lot. There was a leadership symposium last year um, that was co-sponsored by the Chinese American Librarian Association, Anna Paula. And um, there was a large discussion around barriers for professional growth and upward mobility and how frustrating that can be for so many people. And I would be happy to share the link to that in a bit as well. Lots of microaggressions, the constant othering or feeling foreign, um, not American enough. Um, and you know, also the concept um, that kin folk are not skin folk, folks who other, you know, women um, or even Asian women who make it to the top and want to hold onto that power and not help lift anyone else up, right? Um, or having a full-time job and not being able to, to engage in all of that extra stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so much good stuff here. And I just wanna thank you all so much for um, communicating. Um, and I think this one is pretty salient too. People want to harvest your ideas and they appreciate your intelligence, but not enough to promote you or make you a leader. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and yeah, if you're not the loudest or the most quote unquote assertive, you may not be seen as a leader as well. Annie, do you have anything to add before we move on to the next slide? No, I think a lot of what folks are putting in this resonate with me. And I think it's like the not being the loudest and most assertive. And then if you are, you fall into that dragon lady trope. So you kind of can't win either way. Yeah, definitely. And also, um, you and I have talked often about that kind of model minority stereotype, which a lot of folks are referring to here as well. Thank you so much. And we will make sure to share a copy of these slides with everyone that have all of these um, anonymous comments in as well. Yeah, I mean, keeping all of this in mind, how do we push back against some of these challenges? Um, so I, I actually have some ideas about this. Um, like a lot of you who were contributing on the previous slide, um, I've often been told that the way I talk isn't assertive enough. Um, my voice is too soft, too high pitched. It goes up at the end of the sentence. It sounds like a question instead of a statement. I've been told multiple times that I should get voice coaching because the way that I talk is weak. It's unsure. It's not confident. I should, I should speak more, more firmly. 
Um, and for a long time, that really destroyed my confidence, right? Um, but I thought a lot and kind of the way that I talk is the way that I was raised. It's a deliberate and cultural way to get consensus and check in with others, right? The lilt at the end of my sentences checks for agreement. It leaves room for discussion instead of making a statement or a decision that is final. So I think that sometimes doing that self-reflection and realizing like that what someone is telling you is like wrong is actually like the best way, the right way. It's just like those lemons, right? My lemon, my lumpy lemon makes the best lemon candy because the skin is so thick that when you boil it and coat it in sugar, it is amazing. So I think that, you know, realizing that the spaces weren't built for me, but that I don't have to change because the space wasn't built for me, right? I'm perfect the way that I am. I think realizing that we all belong, I don't need to assimilate. None of you need to assimilate or give up your culture or ways of being, um, and I think what's inspiring to me is seeing so many other Black Indigenous people of color around me who are choosing to unapologetically be themselves, walk through the world loud and proud, creating space for everyone. And I find that really, really um, inspiring. Um, I think other ways I push back are by finding places to lead, even if it's not my formal workplace, finding balance. Um, continuing to learn and grow, realizing that when I make mistakes, when I own them and commit to growing and doing better, it just is, it's the best way to move through the world. And finally, finding joy um, in my daily. So, um, you know, my kids really center me, um, these beautiful, amazing kids who are, you know, children of queer Asian parents who are moving through the world, you know, proud as can be to be our kids. And I think finding that joy um, is, is really important. So Annie, I'm curious for you, um, you know, reflecting on intersectionality, which has come up a lot in our conversations today and reflecting on um, what else do you think is at play when we encounter um, these types of barriers and challenges? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about you know, what does it mean when people tell you, oh, you shouldn't speak with a lilt at the end of your sentences? I mean, a lot of that is very coded and gendered, right? So, and I think like this conformity towards like, what is it like masculinity or whiteness as a, like branding that is what's seen as leadership or visionary, you know, we think this is the kind of thing that we need to like untangle and just touching upon the like model minority stereotype and a lot of what folks had said, just being seen good enough to do the work, but not seeing good enough to be a visionary or a leader. And where I think a lot of Asian American women get stuck in middle management and not a leader beyond that. I think that very much is, you know, goes back to that bamboo ceiling. And I think that we actually have to say this too, that there is a certain way that Asian American women are perceived in the workplace and in this society that is extremely misogynistic, extremely toxic and harmful. And we have seen evidence of this in the violence and mass shootings and murders of Asian American women over the last couple of years. And so what do we need to dismantle? I think we need to dismantle white supremacy and its work culture characteristics. And also while we're at it, um, we can also, dismantle the patriarchy, because I think these are all of the things that are harming us. And not just us, I mean, this really harms like society in general. But that's a great transition into our next section. 100%. Um, okay, so um, we are gonna go just a little bit over time, but I think that's okay, we'll be all right. Um, so self-care for Asian American women. Um, Let me see, let's move into this section. And I am, um, I'm wondering, Annie, like what motivates you despite all the anti-Asian hate, the um, stereotyping and model minoritizing at work, what motivates you to engage and care about issues affecting our communities? Yeah, I, wanted to share a couple of inspirational quotes from an Asian American disability activist, Alice Wong. We could just 
Um, so this quote reads, we contain multitudes as Asian Americans and our lives are not linear, neat or monolithic. There's so much diversity, brilliance and nuance within the umbrella of Asian Americans that most people still do not know or understand. Um, and this was actually recently featured on the 18 million rising Instagram account. Um, and I am also going to share a link to uh, Alice Wong's most recent book, The Year of the Tiger. Um, and I really look to Alice's work to really keep in mind intersectionality within our affinity spaces and to be reminded to center the folks who traditionally have been left out, right? So I think, again, as Alice talks about the sort of diversity and like nuance even within our own communities, that's like something that I think is really important to keep in mind. And I wanna share the next quote. Um, and why I continue to engage, I think that Alice also really illustrates this well. So I'll just read this quote really quickly. I never intended to be an activist, but my life has always been political. I cannot escape it. I have lived every day since I was a child who had to grow up fast, a child of immigrants advocating for herself to teachers and doctors. When I became older and understood white supremacy, ableism, and structural oppression, I realized the fight was not just for myself, but for everyone marginalized and devalued by institutions, systems, and practices. It is the epitome of privilege when people say they are non-political. And I think going back to the feminist values that um, really inform my work, the personal is political. You know, I don't feel like I have a choice. Okay, this is my livelihood. And if I have the ability to speak up and advocate, then it is my responsibility to advocate for other people too, um, who are marginalized. And I'm gonna also share some more links to Alice's work in the chat. But yeah, I think moving on to the next question that I have for you, Alana, um, you know, just, Bearing in mind all of the current events that have been impacting our communities, how do you have emotional boundaries and take care of yourself when you're processing the grief of all of these events, especially when there are silences or things are not acknowledged in our workplaces, in our libraries? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and I think it can be really hard when a lot of the hate and violence seems to be directed at you or those you care about. And when that is compounded by the silence within our library spaces, um, the lack of acknowledgement um, can really add to that feeling that so many of us have of being invisible, right? Um, right now, I mean, I think a lot about the anti-Asian violence, but I'm also thinking a lot about the um, anti-trans hate and legislation as well since my partner is um, trans. And um, I think, again, that's that intersectionality, right? Um, of I'm not trans, I'm queer, my partner is trans, and it definitely impacts um, how we move through the world. You know, we think a lot about um, when we go places, like, will this be safe for someone who's trans? Will this be safe for someone who's Asian? Will this be safe for someone who is woman identified? Um, and, you know, for so many of us, that's so much work, right, to just when you want to just go out and be in the world. Um, I think that, you know, um, being able to kind of have a community of folks to to grieve with, but also community of folks to to celebrate our, our, our queer Asian joy with has been so life saving to me. Um, we have a lot of queer um, AAPI in our lives. Um, other queer AAPI who also have children. And I feel like, you know, um, I don't know, it sounds so cliche, but I do feel like those children are going to change the world, you know. Um, and I feel like having that community to grieve and rage together and to celebrate the joy and celebrate the future, you know, is super important. Um, I also have been getting really into, which I know so many of you are already into, reading um, BIPOC fantasy and sci-fi, which is really just recreating, you know, worlds where we thrive, not just survive, but thrive. And that has just been really revolutionary and amazing. And then I also think that, you know, when we talk about self-care, um, a lot of times within our communities, um, 
you know, it's seen as, as an indulgence, right? And so many of us were raised with these work ethics, right? Um, and that individual indulgence um, is not okay. And when we think about self-care as an individual indulgence, that conversation really excludes systemic and institutional oppression, right? And since we don't acknowledge structural oppression or inequity, um, you know, in library, it's a lot of times that we, we're really missing out how self-care is a vital tool for survival, and a preservation tactic for us, right? It helps retain us in the field. It's an ethical priority. Um, it's critical. Um, and you know, we are all facing these additional hurdles of racism, microaggressions, tokenism. You know, we're code switching at work. You know, we have racial battle fatigue, and so we need to talk about self care, whatever that looks like for you, right? Maybe it's like you know, going for a walk. Maybe it's reading sci fi. You know, the other day I sat in my kids' waiting pool. Um, because it was sunny and no one was home and I pretended I was at a fancy resort. Um, whatever that looks like to you, we really need to kind of renew, remove that stigma of taking care of ourselves because I can't fill up anybody else's cup if my cup is empty. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so just our last portion of our talk is about um, BIPOC solidarity. So I think, Alana, I'm just really curious, what does it mean to stand in solidarity with BIPOC? Um, I could talk about this for an hour, but I'll wrap it up in a minute. Um, so as many folks may know, Apala is just one of six national associations of librarians of color. As an organization, we work hard to support the other um, associations of librarians of color while acknowledging that you know, different issues are going to impact each of our communities differently, but that we can still support our struggles. I also think it's something to allude to something Annie said earlier, within our own Apollo umbrella, our own AAPI um, community, you know, we're not a monolith. How can I stand with folks within our community um, who, who have different struggles than, you know, folks from you know, East Asia or folks who have more privilege, like folks who are multiracial and what have you. Um, how can we all together work towards anti-racism and dismantling um, white supremacy um, in our libraries? You know, we are definitely stronger together than we are separately. And, um, you know, Annie and I have talked a lot about um, some of the things happening in Florida where there's definitely very strategic wedges being driven between, you know, um, the African American community and the Asian American community, you know, by having the governor mandate that AAPI history can be taught in school, but Black history, African American history cannot, right? It's a deliberate choice to try and divide our groups. And I think we need to be more strategic and use all of our intelligence and smarts to really just like say, no, like that's not what's happening, right? we are definitely stronger together. Thank you for that. Um, and in closing, we just wanted to leave you all with a quote from Mariam Kaba, who said that hope is a discipline. So hope is something that you can practice, um, even though you know sometimes it is really hard to access. So we understand that it, Doing this work can be really dispiriting. It can be really exhausting. It can be really sometimes very risky, but I believe that we do this work because we have hope. Hope that we can work towards a collective, like in betterment for our own futures, despite the setbacks that we may face and despite setbacks that we receive even with the little bits of progress that we do make. And I think just knowing that when you feel tired, when you're exhausted, that being in solidarity and having community with each other means that somebody else can also lift you up or help you when you need it. And I hope that um, we can all be inspired to try to help that person too when they need that help. And I think before we end, we did wanna just acknowledge some of the things that Alana was talking about, some of the really oppressive and scary politics that are happening in our country, especially in Florida, where they have politicized and criminalized learning about critical race theory, African-American history, books about people of color, and now basically criminalizing being queer and trans. And so I am also going to share a few links 
in the chat to support specifically trans people in Florida. Um, again, for all of us to practice hope and to also, you know, build community and help each other. So with that, that is the end of our official talk. Sorry for being five minutes over. Um, Alana and I are available via email if you have questions. And then if you have any other questions, you can put them in the Q&A and then we will um, type out the answers. But yes, thank you again for uh, your time and also this opportunity. Thank you so much, Annie and Alana. Um, such words of wisdom. Thank you for the courage to share all that you've learned, all of your experience, so many great ideas and cool use of technology. Uh, I love the dynamic uh, word clouds and, and bringing us into your, your discussion. So we do have time uh, for some questions. So uh, let's open it up uh, to questions. Uh, so feel free to use the Q&A. Um, and Annie and Alana could answer those questions. So we do have one question. What are the other five BIPOC library associations? So it looks like Annie is furiously typing the answer. <laughs> um, we have the Chinese American Library Association, the American Indian Library Association, um, Reforma um, for Latinx or Hispanic speaking folks, um, Black Caucus of the American Library Association, and the Joint um, Council of Librarians of Color is also one of the National Associations of Librarians of Color. Fantastic, Alana. Both and us uh, are also members of the Joint Council of Librarians of Color, which puts on a, a fabulous conference every every four years, three years. Wonderful. Thank you, Alana. And Ray would be mad at me if I didn't mention I'm also on the board of director of the Chinese American Library Association, which does very, very excellent work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so other questions? Uh, we, have, we, have, we have a few more minutes before we um, move into the next panel discussion. Okay, well, so... Um, See, so we have a comment, especially as leaders. How do you distinguish between knowing when you may be misreading a situation and when you're simply reading a situation from your own othered lens? Um, I think that's a good question. I think, I mean, we didn't really touch on like microaggressions, but I think when you spend your whole life feeling othered, I think it's easy to have doubts about how you're perceiving a particular situation. And I think that's where having a peer or a friend that you can run something by just to say, oh, hey, this is what's going on. Like, am I perceiving this this way or is this actually what I think it is? And I think just getting that validation, but I, I mean, the other part of this too is like, you know, because we are socialized and you know, normalizing microaggressions and things like that. I think that self-doubt is just ever present. And that's something that not, not all people have to experience that. And it's just something in particular that I think people of color have to face, especially um, in our fields. So that's just one thing that I know I do. I don't know, Alana, if you have anything to add there. Yeah, I would definitely say um, having other people that you can call up and be like, so this thing happened um, and they can say, no, that was really messed up. You're not imagining it because I think a lot of times it can make you feel bananas when you are being microaggressed or othered on a daily basis. It can make you, it can skew your sense of reality, right? And you can start to doubt yourself and your own intuition. I think a lot of times when you are reading a situation a certain way, it's that way. <laughs> and um, like Annie said, um, you know, being told by other folks, like that's not really what happened or you're overreacting, um, it can cause you to doubt yourself as well. Um, so I think having having folks that you can ask, and I also just, I really believe in, in trusting your own intuition. And, you know, I say that knowing that it took me years to actually get to a place where I could actually hear that voice and listen to it um, because there's so much outside noise telling you that you're not enough or you don't belong. Excellent, Alana. 
Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and move on to the uh, next panel discussion. Uh, just delighted again for the amazing uh, leaders that have uh, stepped to the plate to discuss and share uh, their uh, experience. Uh, so we have um, three amazing panelists, Patty Wong, uh, former ALA president, and of course, uh, many other things So she will share with you. Terry Park with the uh, Asian American Foundation, and of course, also a lot of other amazing experience, and Lily Chen, uh, former partner in crime with me in North Carolina, and fellow rabble rouser who will also share with you her experience, and also is expecting a grandbaby anytime now, apparently, Lily, uh, and so congratulations uh, on that. So let's go ahead and jump into our panel discussion. So let's start with... Could you please provide a brief bio of yourself and why you felt it was important to join today's panel discussion in recognition of Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander month? Uh, and let's start with Lily. Thank you so much, Anthony, for inviting me. I am super excited about this conversation. Um, uh, to this month, uh, obviously, is a a um, and HNPI month also is a mental health awareness month, uh, nurses month. And let me just say, of course, we just celebrated Mother's Day, right? So belated uh, happy Mother's Day to all and grandmothers. Um, today, I think I um, this is related to the uh, Asian American history education. Um, I think that the role that I play probably mostly is as a mother of five children and uh, soon to be a grandmother of two, uh, as well as a youth mental health advocate. So uh, I'm also a nurse educator, as you alluded to. So I'm a um, nurse faculty member at North Carolina Central University and a community organizer. Um, yeah, that's about me. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Uh, Terry, Patty? Terry, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Uh, so my name is Terry Park. I'm the Education and Narrative Change Program Officer at the Asian American Foundation. Uh, TAF has been around for about two years, so we're a new foundation. And uh, the work that I do uh, oversees uh, two pillars, so in education, uh, we're uh, advancing K through 12 uh, API history uh, in as many states as possible, uh, as well as building a network of professional uh, development providers uh, to share high quality curriculum uh, to as many educators, including teachers, to deliver that API history in K through 12 classrooms, as well as supporting higher ed efforts. So, uh, trying to build up Asian American and Pacific Islander studies programs in the U.S. And that's more of my background. Uh, I was a professor of Asian American studies for about eight years. Uh, I was a teaching focus professor in about eight institutions across the US from Ohio to uh, Massachusetts, and most recently the University of Maryland College Park, uh, where I was a faculty member in their Asian American studies program. So um, yeah, higher ed is, uh, uh, and education in gen general is uh, a deep passion of mine, something I've been doing for a, a while. And then I also oversee our narrative change pillar. So that's the other side, the other identity that I hold. Uh, before academia, I was an actor, uh, performance artist. Um, I did a solo show off Broadway that explored my Korean American identity, uh, second generation Korean, Korean American identity uh, as someone who grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and how that identity was shaped by my parents' experiences during and after the Korean War. And so it addressed issues of intergenerational trauma, uh, war, uh, and race. And so a lot of those topics and themes informed my academic work. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to be here, really honored to be with the panelists, as well as the speakers. I just want to say that was an incredible, incredible talk. And uh, really, for me, modeled uh, a, a kind of a feminist presentation where it's not just one person talking to an audience. I love the dialogical aspect of it, how interactive it was. Um, so yeah, uh, really excited to be here. And uh, I live uh, on uh, Ohlone territory, uh, otherwise known as Oakland, California. Thank you. And I'll uh, kick it over to Patty. 
Thanks, Terry. Uh, that was great. Actually, I think one of the things that brings us all together is, is our continual learning from one another about not only the diversity of communities that we live and serve, but who, who we are and how much we have to share together. Um, I identify as third generation Californian, Chinese American with roots in Hawaii. Um, I've been a librarian for 39 years now. And I think um, all my entire professional career and probably my life has been based on, on identity and, um, and communication and how to share the richness of that um, and not be defensive about everything. Um, but I, I, I've been the first in so many things and so many communities. Um, I currently serve as the, um, as a city librarian for Santa Clara City Library. So, and I'm very proud of the fact that actually we're about 42% Asian here. And there's the reason, that's part of the reason why I wanted to come up to serve in this community. Um, one of my critical roles as, as uh, Anthony mentioned has been that I am the first Asian American president of the American Library Association. And that is the first in over 150 years. So that's a um, not a tall order, but I think part of the reason why um, so many of our the great articulation of of our five uh, national associations of librarians of color and um, the joint Con um, council of librarians of color is because ALA did not look like us and continues to not necessarily look like us. Um, it's precisely because of that precedent about why I'm here. Um, I have been both reviled and appreciated because of who I am. Um, but the thing I think that inspires me the most is seeing the faces of my community, of people who look like me, who are inspired and motivated because of what I represent. And um, that's a big responsibility, but it's also um, a delight to be able to serve my community as well as I can. And that in, indeed helps lift and support others. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Lily and Terry as well for all that, all that you do. And, and again, joining us today. So the next um, discussion topic is in many ways, the model minority myth. So the traditional stereotype is that members of the NHPI community are all highly educated, affluent, in general, don't need as much help as the other upper rep, other represented minorities. So let's discuss your thoughts about this, and what we'll start with Terry. Yeah. So, I mean, I think in you know a lot of ways, um, Alana and and Annie addressed this topic uh, in their talk. Um, the ways that, well, first of all, how you know there are certain privileges in certain segments of the Asian American community. And I think we, you know, need to uh, recognize those privileges. So for example, for me, uh, I'm a cisgender man. Uh, I'm East Asian American, Korean American. I come from a middle to upper middle class uh, household. I grew up partly in San Jose actually uh, before my family decided to move to Salt Lake City, Utah, <laughs> for some reason. Um, but yeah, in a lot of ways, my upbringing uh, exemplifies the model minority myth, right? We did have some class privilege. Um, at the same time, that doesn't inoculate us from other kinds of discrimination. Um, you know, Anthony, you shared some of your stories, your vulnerabilities. Um, for me, I have a memory of being five or six years old in San Jose, um, waiting for my mother, my immigrant Korean mother to pick me up from school. Um, and I remember as she approached me, she called my name out um, and she's not a fluent English speaker. And I remember seeing a couple of white kids nearby laugh at my mother. And even as a five-year-old, six-year-old, I knew exactly why, why they were mocking my mother. Uh, and it just, it just shattered me. And in that moment, I learned that my mother was not normal, uh, did not belong to San Jose, to California, to the U S and by extension, I didn't belong. 
And so I think one of the insidious parts of white supremacy, no matter uh, your class level ethnic background, is it can uh, those ideals of who should belong can be internalized to the point where you decide to hate your own mother. And that's what I learned to do. Uh, I think from that point on, and especially in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is predominantly white, predominantly conservative, predominantly Mormon, uh, I understood uh, that my belonging was contingent on whiteness and, and uh, my entrance into whiteness, which I tried so hard to do, constantly knocking on the door of whiteness. Um, and I just, and I couldn't gain admission. And I remember blaming my mother for that reason, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to share that personal story and also recognize that there are uh, significant significant communities within the AAPI umbrella that do not match the model minority myth, that are not crazy rich Asians, that aren't going to the Harvards and Stanfords and MITs, uh, that do not have intergenerational wealth. And so the, I think we need to uh, highlight how the model minority myth is exactly that, right? For especially Southeast Asians, uh, refugee communities, certain pockets of South Asians, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as certain East Asian Americans, right? In New York City, the group that experiences the highest poverty rate are Chinese Americans. So I think we need to disaggregate the data and have a more complex understanding of the inequities within the AAPI community so we can have these tough conversations on our privileges and uh, on uh, the power imbalances. Thank you, Terry. And I think you just reiterated why um, shallow labels really are incorrect and invalid, right? And and, and I think we I appreciate you sharing that as well, uh, your experience, Terry. Uh, uh, Lily, uh, Patty? Yeah, um, Terry, thank you so much for sharing your experience as a, as a mother, right? As I alluded to before, um, as an immigrant from China, um, as a graduate student, so what I experienced was that I didn't know what was going on with my children when they were uh, experienced microaggression, uh, even being bullied. Uh, when my children has been bullied for 10 years, I didn't even know because uh, I didn't grow up here and I didn't experience, I didn't have these experiences. So as an immigrant uh, first generation, uh, parents, um, we didn't know what was going on with our children. And, and that, uh, because of that experience they have, and that I'm, I can share later on, and they have impact on their mental health. I also work as a school nurse for over 10 years. So I saw, um, I remember when incident I work in high school, um, that one of the children, Asian children, um, got caught with using and drugs, he was just shaking uncontrollably, shaking uncontrollably. And we haven't said anything yet in the health office. So finally say, he goes, you know, my parents are going to kill me um, because the expectation of the modern minority perpetuate, uh, internalize uh, on them that they are, even though her parents might not be part of their parents, we love our children the best we could, right? But it's just the expectation and of, of the modern minority myth internalized on them. And, and he realized how these um, incidents is going to affect him. So, um, and another uh, limitation or uh, negative consequences that when the children, because we know that we are not, like I'm not very good at math, right? Because uh, a lot of our children are not necessarily uh, academically excelling um, that, but they're expected to. So what that means is that when they're really struggling, it's like, oh, you know, you're supposed to be smart. You should be getting this. So, so many of my friends, children, they're struggling, they're applying or they're wanting to get extra help from school and they're not because, you know, you should be fine. So our kids actually just suffering silence. And lastly, I want to say is as a nurse in terms of health data, 
that is so incredibly important that um and actually the status status report uh, out of the Morehouse that released last year and they say that they couldn't even get any Asian American data theory your researcher right of health disparity because we're so underrepresented understudied they couldn't even have a data to show the health disparity in Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders right so these all as a result of the structural racism and including the minor minority, and we're doing fine. You're not supposed to get sick. And if you're getting, so there's a lack of health data. And it, you know, we all know this is part of the reason is only 0.17% of the National Institute of Health uh, funding goes to the a AAPI communities and 0.7. You know, I learned that from the TAF summit. Thank you so much for a fantastic summit. Less than 0.7% of the philanthropy money goes to AAPN. How do you expect us to have the resources to pay attention to our own community? And that's what I experienced as well as a first year. I just finished my first year PhD study at University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. Is that all the studies were 20 years old. They're using the secondary data analysis. I couldn't find too much of data to illustrate the struggles of our own community in terms of mental health. So I decided I want to do uh, original research, collect my the first primary data. So these are the, some of the things that I think that how the modern minority um, really have a negative impact on a personal level, community level, as well as societal level. Thank you, Lily. Um, and Patty, I just want to say you are an incredible role model. Uh, and I, I want you to know what you've accomplished in many different directions uh, is inspiring to us all. So I just wanted to share that, uh, but go ahead, Patty. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and Lily, for sharing both personal, but also your professional um, endeavors in terms of the study of, of our community and, and the richness and depth and actually lack of attention, I think is what you're sharing. Um, because there is already this assertion that um, the AA um, NHPI community is doing well. Um, you know, regardless of whether we like it or not, that model minority myth, we need to actually disassemble it ourselves. And, um, and, and otherwise there's going to be this increasing disparity. What we know to be true is actually Pacific Islanders and native Hawaiians actually are the most economically challenged with the greatest health disparities. So you can't keep combining groups together like that. Um, I think one of the things that um, frightens me all the time is that because we have learned over time to lean into these um, fairly um, racist notions of the federal government, including all of these peoples together. Um, and because that's where money's coming from, that's where opportunities are coming from. We continue to lean into that minority uh, methodology that actually we're all the same when we are not. And um, we need to actually challenge, I think, those notions um, quite a bit, actually. Um, I, I, and, and, and actually develop maybe our own methodologies for actually representing. It means that we have to count our own people. It means that we have to assert in different ways. It means that we have to publish and, and, and make room for all of these things. And I think one of the things that Anthony asked us to do is to think about how libraries can make that difference. Um, libraries can actually support and, and articulate and bring together different levels of leadership and research um, and work with you, Lily and Terry and Anthony, uh, for really articulating. I'm so glad that we're part of this because we need to start becoming our own scholars in terms of the work that needs to be done. Um, and inviting community to be part of that, because uh, part of that is the education of all of our communities um, to do this well um, and, and to take some responsibilities, I think, um, in terms of changing the narrative. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, we could spend hours talking about each of these prompts, uh, but let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next one. So the next one is really addressing the increase in violence um, head on. So 
What do what does the panel feel is behind the increase of violence, xenophobia, and overall discrimination being felt by some members of the AANHPI community? And I'll share that the the doorbell ringing and the trash on the doorstep. Um, I think as Alana and Annie mentioned, you know, I'm not even sure if it was specific to me being Chinese American. Um, however, we're pretty. Uh, pretty confident it is because, of course, the increase uh, in and the, the time period that it occurred. So, um, what what some of the causes you feel are behind this, and also what can people do to help? We'll start with Patty. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think actually, since all of us have mentioned different experiences in our lives, I believe actually it's been with us for a long time not just now. I do think that there's um, that the increase though, and the increase of awareness um, is due to more people reporting, which is essential. Um, so for all those people listening, please encourage your team members to, to say something. Um, but I think the increase is due to social media, to uh, misinformation about our COVID experience, um, political rhetoric, racism. Um, I, I encourage everyone to do the following, which is, of course, and I took this directly from the Stop Asian Hate um, uh, website, but it I think it pertains to everyone. We need to report, we need to educate, we need to engage. Um, we need to be an upstander in the work. And I, I know that, you know, that sort of is, is the common theme that I'm threading through my answers, but I, I do think that it's so critical for us to not let this opportunity pass us by and, and we need to stand up for what we believe in. Um, I do think that libraries can do a number of things actually um, in terms of their programming, um, in terms of their connections, in terms of the celebrations that we bring, in terms of becoming more aware and in, in terms of actually establishing the reading list. Um, I'll tell you there's one story, there's also things that we do to each other. And so I'm gonna just share one thing. Um, I was in, um, I don't mind saying this out loud. Um, I was working for um, the city of Oakland as a student intern, actually during my library school days. And um, a wonderful teacher from our local immersion Chinese school came to me and said, I want a list of all of the great Chinese American and, and Asian American books for kids because they're not able to see themselves. And I said, fantastic. So I went about and put it together. And she said, there's a couple that you're missing. And, you know, I wasn't a staff person. I was an intern. So frankly, it got to be a little elevated because she wanted to um, chastise me. And um, I had left off two two um, stories and I and I'll share them with you because I think they epitomize and people may not remember these but back in the day um, uh, these were published in the 1930s the story of Ping was one of them and then the five Chinese brothers was the other not the new version we've got but the old version and I said to her Can, let's take a look at these books and see what they say to the children in your classroom and when she looked at them, she said, they're Chinese folk tales. And I said, well, number one, they're not Chinese folk tales. They are American versions of things that actually were perpetuated as Chinese because they, they needed to have a, 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 you know, they needed to have a, a function and a grab and an anchor. But look, at, let's look at the illustrations. And what did they say to your children? I said, they are stereotypical. They um, have um, the, the individual um Characters participate in things that are extraordinary and also lazy and dumb. And there's some characteristics that are very not positive. And so what you want to do is share the best with your children, not just because they have Asian characters. Um, and so, you know, we were able to actually get to yes there. Uh, but what I'm sharing with you is that sometimes we need to take that time to educate even the people who are closest to us in the field. Um, because we don't all grow up and we don't, we, we're all learning together. So um, I share that with you as how libraries and library staff can make a difference in the choices that they make, in the dialogues that they present, um, in the programs that we can share, because one group uplifts others. So um, anyway, I'll stop there. I know the others have a lot of great things to share. Thank you, Patty. Lily? 
Um, thank you so much, Patty. I, um, you know, again, as a parent, I, I would love, love to have more books on Asian American history. Um, my oldest child, again, I had no idea. So when she went to college, um, and I think the second year, um, so we had a conversation and she, uh, she really started very emotional. And she asked that, uh, mom, I said, I had no idea. Uh, I thought the Chinese American history started when you and dad came to this country in the 1880s because we learned nothing about our history in the school. And uh, we live in Chicago. It's one of the suburbs. I'm not going to name you which one, right? We are considered as one of the best schools district. And my children really had a superb education, right? Nothing about it. So I cannot emphasize enough what you're doing. And so that my grandchild and grandchildren will be able to learn since preschool. And so now my daughter has a lot of books about Asian history, about Chinese American history, about minority history, and reading to her, um, my granddaughter, my lovely little granddaughter. So that's what I was hoping. It's wonderful, Lily. And I think, too, what everyone is saying is so important is having raised three, my youngest is 20 now. It's very tiring. Uh, and going to the library, going to the bookstore, if those books aren't easily convenient as well, oftentimes it's not going to be part of the collection that you purchase for your kids uh, or borrow from your kids. So, yeah, very, very important points from from all three of you. And Terry, again, thank you for TAF for the work that you all are doing because it is addressing strategically, you know, su such a need uh, across the lifespan to, to, and I think as Patty said, we need to tell our own stories. Uh, we, we need to set the record straight. Absolutely. <clears throat> and um, I, yeah, it's uh, very moving to be a part of this panel and to hear from Lily and Patty uh, and, and everyone else here. Um, so yeah, at TAF, we want to normalize and institutionalize AAPI history, uh, in all 50 states so that we're not reduced to a paragraph or a sentence or some throwaway page, but, uh, to show both, uh, AAPIs and non-AAPIs that AAPI history is American history. Uh, that's a mantra that we've been repeating. And I would go even further than that. I feel like that's not enough. I uh, I would want to also emphasize that API history is intrinsically a part of Black history, Latinx history, uh, Native American history, LGBTQ plus history, that these histories uh, cannot and are not uh, segregated, but that they are deeply uh, intertwined and intersectional. And so we, we cannot lift up our own communities without working in solidarity and coalition uh, with other communities um, in order to combat the divisive nature of the bottom minority myth. And it's really honoring the legacy of the birth of ethnic studies at San Francisco State College, uh, at UC Berkeley in the late 1960s as part of the Third World Liberation Front, right? That uh, uh, wanted belonging, but also question the terms of that belonging. And so uh, I think that's something I think we need to do, right? We should assert our belonging, but also at the same time, redefining what are we belonging to? Um, uh, Lily mentioned that we had a summit a few weeks ago in New York City, and uh, among the many great panels, we had one on the status index report, and I highly recommend folks uh, check out our website, check out the status index report. It speaks to the need to document our own data, right? Um, and uh, one of the panelists, uh, Paul Watanabe, a great professor at UMass Boston, um, along with Russell Jung, who co-founded Stop AAPI Hate, you know, they both said, you know, we live in a country of mass incarceration, mass deportation. And so uh, if that's what we want to belong to, then maybe I want to remain a perpetual foreigner, right? It was a pretty 
I think, disruptive and radical statement, but I think it's something that we, we really need to reckon with, right? Not just simply assimilate into a society riven with inequities, but to transform those inequities so that America is a place of belonging for all of us and not just for some of us. Um, and so that's what we're aiming to do in our education work at TAF. I think, um, you know, that's our North Star. Uh, and um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just end it there. And uh, let me, let me just, uh, I guess, concluding thought on this topic is that the, the cup half full is that I think because of the increase in violence and xenophobia, so many of us are now pushing back and refusing to re remain silent uh, any longer. And I think that as Patty well stated, it was there all along. And to be candid, we know that these acts of violence uh, are just a tip of the iceberg. And it does reflect, unfortunately, how some of our uh, neighbors, uh, et cetera, think about us, right? And so I think the one positive, many positive, but one of the biggest positives is we're having this conversation now, TAF was formed, and we're just not gonna be silent any longer, right? And I think that um, I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities uh, that we we have for Lily's great, great grandchildren, hopefully mine at some point as well. So thank you. Um, now let's talk about mental health. So mental health, of course, is a, a challenge and issue in all communities. Um, but I think it is also as part of the model minority myth and also uh, part of uh, some of the culture of uh, uh, some, uh, some of the ethnic groups at AA and HPI. So let's talk about mental health. So mental health is also starting to become more of a discussion in our community. What are some of the issues around mental health being faced by members of the AA and HPI community? Uh, and let's start with uh, Lily. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm so I'm glad that we're finally talking about something I'm so passionate about. Um, so as we talk about mental, model minority myth, right? Uh, we talk about history. We talk about um, the um, under representation in our community and what that does to our uh, health or mental health. You know, you can't have help without the mental health, right? This is part of wellness is that we, um, we have increased mental health crisis across the board, but especially in AAPI community because of the factors I, we just have collectively addressed. The issue is that facing our community is that I think it's awesome. We talk about anti-Asian hate. We break the silence like the situation is right, like right now. And we share our stories, recognize intersectionality of our community as a whole. What we haven't talked much about, even with TAFs, just allow me to be honest, and even with a lot of organizations that we have not talked about healing and the effects of these anti-Asian hate, these horrible things happen to us, how that affect to our health and mental health. And racism is a strong predictor, one of the strongest predictor of mental health. We know that our, our community is suffering and our kids are suffering. And then we did a, a national survey at the Chinese American Convention uh, 2022 that I'm part of United Chinese American, this national coalition for Chinese American organizations dedicated to civic engagement, youth development, and heritage sharing, right? So we had the national convention in DC la last year that we did a survey about, it's not like a task, a status report, right? But it is something, it's still data that 43 of our children, of the youth, that experience mental health symptoms. And majority experience, um, experience of microaggression, racism, is very consistent with the national data, whether it be the status report or committee 100 that came out. But I haven't seen much about the solution and about the resources dedicated. We know that that's a problem. And it's intuitively know that, but what about 
the resources that dedicated to improve the mental health of our children, our youth, right? I have, I think this is one of the biggest challenge and uh, piggyback on what I have shared before that we don't have enough resources from the mainstream, the NIH or the philanthropy, right? So I think this is the biggest challenge, but we can't suicide is the leading cause of death in Asian American youth 15 to 24, yet, Asian Americans are three times less likely to seek mental health services than white. And lagging behind all minority groups, we, you have, you know that. We know that we are a community. We're trying to save face with culture barriers. We have language barriers. We have a provider mismatch. Even though when we get help and then we don't perceive it as helpful. So we have these suicide leading costs with less likely help. What is left? for the community members. We cannot just wait until the bilingual providers are being trained and or the mainstream providers are being having the training about culture, sensitivity training, all that. As a community organization, that's my most important hat as an advocate. We must do something to help our kids because of this gap. So I don't want to just leave you guys or leave the audience with this green the outlook of the mental health, but I wanted to share with you that I think a lot of community organizations, including NAMI Chinese, including UCA WAVE, that I'm the project director for um, WAVE stands for Wellness, Advocacy Voices, Education and Support, that I just have a keynote speech at the city of Chandler, Arizona, and how we operationalize WAVEs, and that we did mental health first aid training. We overcame so much barriers um, we got a federal funding from the SAMHSA, and we are making a documentary film about Asian Americans' families' experience of mental health. We have Chinese American families. We have families and community from LGBTQ. We have families from the Sikh community. It was just so empowering, so empowering to hear the collective trauma that we often experience at the same time. I realized we just cannot sit and wait. Everybody can do something about it. For the parents and for all of the people in the audience, and simply as the parents would just say, how are your children doing? How are you feeling? How's your school life? Simple things like that, just active listening, empathetic listening. They don't need you to be their teacher. They need you to love them, right? As an advocate, half or Anthony, all of you here, we just need to advocate for more resources. We have a bigger pie so that all of us can get the resources. And so anyway, um, I can talk forever, you can tell, but I'm gonna stop right there. I just really, what you're doing here and what, what, what the conversation here is really allowing me to have a voice to advocate for our community and that we need to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly. And so just to pile on the tap, I'm just kidding, Terry. But, but I will share with you that the pivotal moment that I shared earlier about pulling our children out of um, uh, elementary school is that for the first time ever in their lives, they were telling me they started to hate school because of how they were being treated at school, right? And my conversation with the principal convinced me that I had to pull them out of school because all she was talking about was academic performance, right? And so they were not understanding the fact that uh, a, being Asian American or BIPOC uh, came with other issues, right? And that's why, and to be candid, I think that's why a lot of other people homeschool as well, because there's that disconnect. It's, it's, it need, and so I just want to throw that out that Terry, I think building on what Lily said, even if you're doing well in school, there are other issues, right? Uh, and of course, as parents, we love our children. It's not just academic success only. It's that they're happy and healthy and they're not coming home telling us that what's wrong with being Asian, right? So anyway, but Terry, Patty? Uh, yeah, I just really appreciate this conversation and uh, the expertise. Lily, thank you so much um, for lifting up the challenges of uh, mental health within our communities. And I think we can all do better, uh, both uh, AAPIs and non-AAPIs to 
not just advocate for more resources, but culturally competent resources. Because, you know, as a former educator, a former professor, I had lots of students come to my office hours uh, because they didn't trust the counselors at their uh, campus clinic uh, because they weren't trained to understand the specific needs and histories, challenges of uh, of Asian Americans. And so a lot of us professors became uh, our uh, de facto therapists. And that's not our job that I can't, I can't hold enough space for my students as much as I uh, would want to. So we need uh, those tailored resources, right? And I think we can all advocate uh, for those resources at our campuses, uh, at our uh, communities. Um, I also wanted to add that, and this kind of touches on, again, the amazing talk by Alana and Annie about patriarchy and the need to dismantle patriarchy uh, within our communities. You know, I think uh, another pernicious stereotype uh, that's specifically aimed at Asian American men is that we're not masculine enough, right? We're not manly enough. That's uh, a stereotype that's haunted us uh, for decades, for centuries, especially in film and television, uh, from Long Duck Dong in the 1980s to, I mean, there's so many stereotypes, right? That's become normalized. Uh, the fact that we are asexual, emasculated. And for me, as a young Asian American man growing up in Utah, I, I felt that, I knew that. And it I didn't understand it at the time, but I think it was a it was a mental health issue. It made me feel awful about myself. I, I didn't want to be Asian American. And I did everything to prove my masculinity primarily through sports, right? And uh, you know, sort of equating being American and being white as dominating, dominating the basketball court, the baseball field, dominating other women. And I think we're seeing the rise in the past few years of a right word turn for some Asian American men who feel that lack of masculinity. And then they see the men's rights activist movement as a space where they can feel like a real man with incredibly harmful consequences, right? For, uh, for, uh, 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 people who identify as women within our communities and outside our communities. And so I think uh, as, as cisgendered men, we need to really pay attention to these harmful discourses so that we don't perpetuate patriarchy within our communities, within our families, because it could be so destructive. And to show other models of masculinity, that there's not just one way of being a man, uh, but that I think there are models within our families, within our communities that emphasizes uh, collaboration, collectivity, that moves away from individualism, that says it's OK to cry, to be vulnerable, to be empathetic, to go to therapy. It's OK to go to therapy. Actually, it's great. I go to therapy. I love therapy. I can't get enough of therapy. Uh, and I think we're seeing more of that in uh, film and television a little bit. Uh, I think we need to lift that up more. I think Jeremy Lin is actually a great example of uh, an empathetic Asian American masculinity, right? I think he's cried in, in in press conferences, and he was he received a lot of flack for that, for just sharing his emotions. I think we need to honor that kind of masculinity uh, within our communities. Fantastic, Terry. L Lily, you had a comment, and then we'll go to Patty. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You can tell. You know what? I wanted to pick about what Terry said. You know, Simi Liu came to your summit, right? So he was so open because I cannot emphasize enough the breaking the silence. And he would just, I think he say something along the lines like, you know, my parents, you know, this and that. And I just go to therapy or just make it very light. I said, oh, that's Simi, you go. You know, I think it's really important because I have a son too, right? So we don't want to that. I think we owe our emotions. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to cry. It is okay to let you, you know, I was talking to Antoine. It's okay to feel angry. We are entitled to have feelings, emotions, even though we may not have the language to describe it, but it is normal. We recognize that. And that's great. Sorry, that's it. 
That's actually a wonderful addition, Lily. <laughs> Thank you both for being so honest and open and um, persuasive to, to our community listening that we need to take action. Um, here's my comments on, on a few things. I think um, we are getting to a point where everything personal is political. And every one of us has a responsibility to take some action, whatever that may be. Um, you know, I think I, I agree, Lily, totally. We need more resources. I also think that we need to be a little bit more imaginative about what we can do locally. So one of the things I'm going to challenge all the library people, because there's going to be a lot of library people in the audience to do, is to think about organizational change. We need, as a community, to be youth development organizations. We cannot rely on other people alone to take that responsibility on. Every young person is an at-risk person, and they need to know that we are there to support them. Um, you know, it could start with something as simple as you know, looking at the 40 assets and actually being mindful that that young person needs, if you could just remember their name, if you could just smile, if you could just make sure that they feel connected. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. When we were in, and it's a collective, it's not just the library, it's everybody around us. When we were, um, when I was working at Davis as the, and, and Yolo County as the librarian, I will tell you the worst day in my life was when we had to go, when the kids got word of where they were gonna go to college. And collectively, the sheriff's department and PD and the library had to go to the railroad tracks to make sure that none of our kids walked onto the tracks because they get, didn't get into the school because there was that much pressure. So I'm not saying, um, uh, you know, so that's part of that whole model minority myth and a lot of pressure that we put on our children, a lot of pressure they put on our, themselves, but for what, right? So I think we have to understand, and there's cultural nuances to everything, but I would strongly encourage all of our library folk out there, but even in your own institutions that you become youth development institutions in addition to that wonderful mission that you support right now, because all of our young people need that support. But if there's cultural um, development along with that, that makes it that much richer. And that means, of course, that mental health is so important. Mental health is a public health issue. And of course, what we know is that race is the strongest predictor of life success, including public health and mental health. And so if we combine all of those ideas and thoughts and actually are able to articulate to our community, that's even better. Um, I will say that um, one of the things that I love that New York did when, um, when all of their seniors were actually having a hard time and they were trying to teach self-defense is that the public library raised their hand and said, you can come in and use our space for free because that was a, just a resource. So I, I, I thank all of you for the brave space that you're making for the conversation. Um, and, and, and the more space that we can offer to this and the shared space, um, the better. But I definitely think Mental health is not only one of the most taboo subjects among many of our AAPI communities. Um, we need to talk about it. We need to um, safeguard it. We need to make sure that it's safe. It becomes not just commonplace, but acceptable within our own communities and our cultures that we make room for it, that we make it easy to obtain. That means that maybe we, you know, libraries can actually provide some space for some of those things. We have, um, you know, we have telehealth, which, uh, but I don't know that we do that much around telemeta, you know, health when it comes to mental health communities. Um, anyway, I'll stop there. But I think there's a lot of things that we can do. I solely appreciate the difficulty that it's in and the crisis of the nature of everything. But I do think that we can think collectively of some solutions in working together. Thank you. Thank you all. And and so Patty and Terry uh, and I are, are in conversations with ALA to talk about trying to address together some of these things. So, and Lily, I think we may, we may need to invite you into that conversation as well. Um, it also amazes me how quickly two hours go by when you, when you have the privilege of talking uh, to so many uh, wonderful people and and having such uh, poignant discussions. But we have two more prompts left that we're going to try to get to. I'm going to switch the order 
um, to kind of follow up with what Patty was saying. So what can libraries do to best support the AA and HPI community moving forward? And, and of course, Patty gave a good example. So let's continue on that. And what about non AA and HPI members in terms of helping address or not continue to per- per- perpetuate stereotypes? So kind of a two-parter um, and we'll start with, with Patty. I think I've actually said quite a bit, but I, you know, there's one thing that I want to make sure that we don't leave off the table. And that is the complexity of being uh, within the AA um, uh, and HPI community is also that we are also mixed. And so I wanted to bring that up because that's, that's actually spoken about by a number. My children also are mixed and I will tell you, it's a different milieu. It's a different kind of experience. It is not the same as, um, so I wanted to actually kind of showcase that because my kids all, all are already talking about how can we create some activism around, you know, we use the word HAPA, but, but it really is any children who are of mixed, who actually have a very, um, and they're worried about their future because they are treated differently and they treat each other differently. Um, and uh, anyway, what what they had suggested to me is actually that we create more open space for forums like this so that community can start to talk about it. Um, and that, uh, you know, especially around, um, you know, other ways that we can create more equity. Um, one other way that I didn't talk about is digital equity. And, um, you know, libraries are, are great places to meet and, and to provide programs and to feel, uh, and the collection certainly. But what we know to be true is that a lot of our population is still not, um, they don't have the same access that other people do. And that, that I mean by digital access. Um, uh, most of the community that, um, community success and even engagement, getting jobs, um, applying for anything requires digital access. And in so many parts of the country, we don't have robust, free, easily accessible, high-speed internet access. And I know that um, that may not be on, on the top of your thinking about what libraries need to do, but the, it is on my part uh, that digital equity is key to the success of our community and especially around our AA uh, national, um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community. So um, I hope that libraries will continue to expand the, 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 and bro- the broadcasting um, and also the um, access to materials and equipment um, in, in such a way that is also culturally resonant um, and also uh, equitably based. We need to find out where those holes are in our community to make um, inroads and to be right there to provide the resources and to advocate for that at all levels. So that's just another way. I'll pass it on. Thank thank you very much, Patty. Uh, Terry, Lily? Um, I, I'm not a librarian, I, <laughs> but I uh, deeply appreciate the work of librarians and the space of libraries, uh, everyone here. Um, yeah, I don't want to say much, uh, especially if folks have questions, but um, just to echo what, what folks said, especially around how AA and HPIs were not a monolith. And so uh, just to prioritize ensuring uh, books and other materials that are um, specific to the experiences of Southeast Asians or South Asians, uh, adoptees, multiracial Asian Americans, and uh, relying on the expertise of the folks within those communities, right? Um, and, you know, uh, kind of like what uh, Patty described earlier with that 1930s uh, book, not all <laughs> AAPI resources are great. Um, a friend of mine who's a, a librarian and a professor, uh, Sarah Park Dolan, uh, she told me about a, a recent children's book written by a Korean American. And so on the surface, it seems great. But uh, apparently, uh, the book makes fun of Korean food, uh, kimchi, the sort of odor of of Korean food and how that gets racialized to make Korean Americans feel horrible about themselves. Like that was written by a Korean American. So 
it's not a guarantee, right? That uh, uh, resources, books from our communities uh, live up to um, uh, a good portrayal of our communities, right? So that vetting still needs to be there. Um, but yeah, it there. Um, thank you so much, uh, Patty. I would just add one point that um, as a community organ organizer, right? Because I am um, from Chicago and a number of our own organizations, the UCA chapters, community partners, they uh, self-organize and donated like a Chicago public school. They donated about uh, like a 2000 pieces of books last year, two years ago. So, and then this year as well, um, in Naperville, where I came from, well, I just gave away the school district, I guess, but anyway, it's a great school district. And then, um, there's a Chinese American for action and they also organize book drive, just, just, just the community I know. And I was very part of it too, that I think that re realizing there's some incredible power in the community-based organizations, they are very much eager to be part of the narrative change um, by doing everything you can. So I would encourage the libraries and, and collaborate and reach out to the communal uh, organizations. These are really, I think, not only into the API history and also in mental health advocacy, in uh, civic engagement. And these are really the mover and shakers, not I mean, academia, yes, it is important. It takes a village, but the real power really coming from the grassroots community organizations. So always I would encourage everybody to reach out, to collaborate and harness that power and harness that resources and also that passion. Wonderful, thank you, Lily. Thank you to all three of you. So final question uh, really quickly, then we can entertain some questions is, so to all the non-AA and HPI members that are here now or, or will watch the recording, what, what do you want to know? What do you want them to know about you and the community? What are just some leaving thoughts that you might want to impart to non-AA and HPI people? And we'll start with Terry. Uh, is that question about us specifically or us as a community? Well, I'd say uh, you first, and then I think as a as a community um, from a you know a non member, what what would what would be some kind of leaving thoughts you'd want to share with them? Um, I mean, one thing that pops up is even though I identify as Korean American, Asian American, even though I have a PhD in these things, I don't know everything. I don't know. Uh, everything about Korean America, I'm still learning, and that there are different ways to be Korean American, different ways to be Asian American or Pacific Islander, and it's constantly unfolding. And I think that's the exciting part, is that we're always redefining the project, and it's a political project, of Asian America, Pacific Islander. And I think that's the, uh, the work of librarians. Uh, I think it's the work of all educators. I think it's the work of artists right, to really push the boundaries, to question the terms of what it means to be Korean American, Asian American, et cetera, um, so that we're constantly constantly centering and uplifting those uh, identities that are marginalized, queer identities, uh, disabled identities, uh, et cetera, within our own uh, communities. So I'm an expert, but also not an expert. There are, you know, lots of experts within our uh, communities and, you um, yeah. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Lily, Patty. Um, I would say that I really appreciate Annie and Lang talking about as of uh, AAPI women leaders, and I cannot emphasize personally the importance of self care because we needed to uh, have self compassion, and so that when we are full, and then we can extend the grace and compassion to others, especially doing this very very difficult work. Sometimes it can be very discouraging extremely challenging um so take care of yourself um on the community level i um i will really 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 wish everything we do we can have a very strong coalition that we can be very inclusive of all the sectors that involve so that we can only be stronger when we are together so conversation like this i think this is a, such a powerful statement of that 
uh, coalition and that kind of conversation. I think that not only that, it's going to be so much um, more effective, efficient when we not reinvent the wheels in, in every sector. So that's what, that's something, I know that it's tall order and it's so much easier to say than done, but it's still my hope and dream. Thank you, Lily. Patty? You know, I, I, I lean into a little bit of what, when Al Alana and Annie were talking earlier and asking us how we felt at the beginning of this. Um, and I, I, w I will say part of me is questioning all the time, but I think one of the words that I would use again now is not only passionate, but um, uh, invigorated and um, feeling very positive about the work that we've done today because it is work it is it continues to be work as we as none of this is easy right and for some of us it takes years to to develop over time um i encourage everyone who's who's uh to be part of that work to engage to not be afraid to take some brave space um and um you know to continue to communicate and to work as as Lily said, in as a coalition, in collaboration with one another, because we can only go forward. Um, it, you know, I was asked to write a little bit of something for what the libraries of 2035 would look like. And this was weighing on my mind a lot, is that we have a lot of struggles and we seem to keep on um, working in a circle a little bit, but we need to get beyond the circle. It needs to kind of go upward and onward. Um, so I, I'm encouraged and buoyed by by the conversation today, and I I look forward to working with all of you. Wonderful. And then let me just throw out a, a quick thought. I would say to all BIPOC and non BIPOC members that you must not stand for or allow discrimination, racist comments at the dinner table or in public areas to go unchallenged. I think, again, I'm a big fan, Terry, of Jeremy Lin. He shared uh, examples of how, as a Harvard basketball player, he would be at the free, free throw line and racial epitaphs would be thrown at him for everyone in the gymnasium to hear, and nobody said anything. And I also played basketball, not nearly as good as Jeremy Lin, and that happened to me as well. And at that moment, I lost a lot of respect for my coach and my players for not standing up for me when that happened, right? And so that, that's, that's what I would say is that we all can work together, but definitely the majority in particular, you have the power to stop it if it's happening, because it's very difficult if you are being the victim to say anything at the moment, so... With that being said, I want to give, uh, please let's give everyone a loud um, a round of applause. It's a, uh, a digital round of applause for all of their time uh, and expertise. Uh, I can't uh, thank everyone for their time, their energy. And I think as Patty said it best, it's, 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 it's work, right? And I think we all feel both excited, but also probably tired because of all that we shared uh, today. I uh, also want to thank all of our hardworking and dedicated staff that make this possible. Um, Vivian Zuo, our events coordinator, Alfredo Alcantar, who's with us in our Canvas administrator and Zoom guru, Iori Tokunaga, who is our EDI staff writer, uh, student writer, Steve Harganon with Library 2.0, who shared this with his uh, massive following, Nicole Perviance, our director of marketing and their significant role. It's important to also illustrate how much work goes into trying to make sure we have successful gatherings like this. So thank you for joining us. The full transcript and recording and summary of today's event will be posted soon uh, in our EDI library. Uh, also wanted to share with you uh, three events coming up. So Pride Month uh, led by keynote speaker Deb Sika will be Wednesday, July 5th from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Juneteenth Day, which will be June 20th, actually, uh, will be a, po a poet, history, historian, scholar, advocate, Benny Tate Wilkin uh, on June 20th uh, from 10 to noon. And then finally, uh, our uh, Hispanic Latino Symposium will be led by Loida Garcia Febo, also a former uh, ALA uh, president. Final note, um, 
In order to support EDI, you must allocate time and resources to doing the hard work to make it a reality in your respective environments. If you have some privilege, use some of that privilege for this. It's not easy at all, but well worth the effort to attain a higher level of being together for us. We cannot and should not remain silent. Racism towards us is really not our problem, but the problem with the perpetrators themselves. I do think things are getting better, but more work must be done. We are one of the most diverse nations in the world, and the positive sides of this far outweigh the negative. I ask that all of us continue to use our voice and actions to help make the world a better place for us. Thank you again for joining us. Our future, your future is in your hands and shape it as you would like to help to make a better place while you're at it. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.